First, I want to thank Linda Hall Library uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today and um, also for the fellowship and use of the library's resources. Um, the only problem so far has been that there's much more to read and look at than I will have time to do this summer, but it's been a wonderful place to do research. Um, I also want to thank all of you for coming today and your interest, um, your assumed, <laughs> presumed interest in this topic. Um, <laughs> Uh, I won't have very much time right now to tell you all the things I've learned about how to raise a bigger brood of hogs or um, to increase the yield on the frog farms, but there's, there's time for Q&A afterwards. So. Um, but here's a hint. The flies are very attracted to electricity. So, Okay, so um, let's start with some basic facts. Um, Currently, member-owned uh, electric cooperatives are how 75% of the geographical United States gets electricity. There are 840 distribution cooperatives, which purchase power wholesale, and 65 generation and transmission cooperatives that produce electricity themselves. However, this makes up only 12% of all electricity sold, as these operate in low-density rural areas. But this ownership system, which is nonprofit, private, and locally controlled, is out of the purview of most of the public and rarely enters into popular discourse. So the question that remains is, how are these alternative ownership models, how do they persist today? Um, in the advanced capitalist economy, where we've seen increasing privatization through for-profit corporations in most spheres, from education to war contracting to mail service. So this is really the main question I hope to address in my larger research project, which, again, I've just begun um, since arriving here two months ago. And because I'm really only at the beginning of this research, my talk today will detail some of what I found initially interesting in this history, which is from the 1930s to the 1960s, that's what I'm focusing on, um, as well as some of the speculation about where I hope this research might go and what sorts of conclusions I might potentially find. Um, so I look forward to your comments and questions and hope you can help me formulate this research into a meaningful project as we reflect upon what has become such a taken for granted technology for us and that was really a revolutionary change in the lives of the rural population and the country as a whole. As a quick visual introduction to this talk, um, these posters were part of an exhibition on design at the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan, New York, um, which I saw about a year ago, which sort of sparked my interest in this. And they're made as promotional po posters for the Rural Electrification Administration. Um, and they address some of the things that I'll talk about today. So um, as a sociologist, my interest in this technology is is the social, the cultural, and the political aspects of rural electrification. And I'm examining them through the historical way in which they've been developed and governed. I'm focusing on this as a social system developed alongside a technological system. How technologies get coupled with particular social and political structures. The broader significance of such a study can be understood twofold. The first is to understand how technologies are rearticulated over time meaning how the social and political climates in which they are uh, constituted and constitutive of, in a reciprocal manner, relate to their social positions, so how they change um, historically. This is to say that technologies are not just material objects or utility systems. Instead, they are produced by and also produce the subjects and landscapes in which they play a role. And this human material relationship changes over time to produce a particular social reality. The second point of significance is the relationships, relationship between governance and control of technologies and their users. The politics of and authority over the infrastructure of technologies has a broad impact on the human material relationships that are produced through them. The form in which technologies are designed and built allow for certain political forms which then shape our subjectivities as users. This gives great weight to the design of technological systems, not just how they work, but how are they actually constructed as social systems. So technologies have politics and are created with certain possibilities of governance, and they also concretize social relationships based on their material nature. So in other words, once they're designed and built, they're difficult to change, as they are both socially and materially embedded with a particular durability. While much has been written about the social psychological relationships between technologies and users, such as the embodied relationship we have with our tools that we are attached to, like our cell phones or our video games. What I'm suggesting in this research is that the political governance, in addition to direct use, 
acts as a conduit that shapes the subjective meaning produced through technological infrastructures. Again, this has policy implications in how technologies are built and operated. So my research examines the shifting discourses attached to, our produ to or produced through technological practices that indicate changing subjectivities that constitute who we are and how we see and think about the world. I'm referencing Chandra Mukherjee's theory of logistical power to formulate this argument. She builds upon concepts of infrastructural, sh infrastructural state power or the political shaping of civil society that forecloses or opens certain possibilities to include logistics or the ability to mobilize the natural world for political effect. In this case, we can think about how technological infrastructure design and use shapes social practices for a particular political effect, especially as it may or may not compete with other political ideologies, especially when the form taken is an alternative to a normative form, such as the case of these cooperative ownership models. Finally, a question to reflect upon is how technologies shift from being seen as luxuries to being necessities to being something declared as a democratic right to access or where they sit on a level of technological citizenship. So that's the deeper theoretical context in which I'm working. But how does this technological history of rural electrification specifically deploy these concepts? And what can we learn from this in relation to newer technological systems today? I will, at the end, speak briefly about a comparison to rural broadband internet infrastructure that's currently under development. And of course, somewhat related is your new Google Fiber um, network that you're all very excited about. <laughs> and um, some of the sort of policy implications that might come from these discussions. Um, but for now, I'll just focus on rural landscapes. For many of you, the cooperative form might be very familiar, as there are many areas right outside of Kansas City that are serviced through electricity cooperatives that were developed in the 1930s. For those of you who are unfamiliar, let me just describe how these work today, and we can think back through how we got to this point and the significance of it. As described by the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, quote, electric cooperatives are private, not-for-profit businesses governed by their consumers, known as consumer members, there are two federal requirements for all cooperatives, which are democratic governance and operation at cost. Specifically, every consumer member can vote to choose local boards that oversee the co-op, and the co-op must, with few exceptions, return to the consumer members revenue above what is needed for operation. Under this structure, electric co-ops provide economic benefits to their local communities rather than to distant stockholders. So members vote for representatives to run their co-op, and then they also get money back, um, a dividend of any profit made after operating costs. They're also often very community involved and oriented, including newsletters and publications, such as these, um, that go far beyond describing electricity uses. Um, they include things like recipes, updates on local elections. This one has some particularly good recipes that I'll let you look at at the end. Um, local activities, events, all sorts of sort of community um, support. In their own words, cooperatives, um, the adherence to seven cooperative principles is what makes cooperatives different. Um, these include voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, meaning they're democratic organizations controlled by their members who have equal voting rights over decisions and representatives. Uh, member, members' economic participation, they contribute equally to and democratically control the capital of their cooperative. Autonomy and independence, education, training, and information. They inform the general public of the benefits of cooperation. There's cooperation among cooperatives and concern for community. Um, cooperatives work for the sustainable development of their communities. So I hope this exemplifies is how different these electricity providers operate than a regular company. So think about this in contrast to your cell phone provider, your internet provider. Um, <laughs> we all love our cell phone providers, right? Um, and particularly the relationship to community support and democratic practices that are written into their operation. Um, most of the historical materials I've been looking at are a series of journals published by the Federal Rural Electrification Administration. Here's a few of the early covers of what I was looking at. 
So it's important to note that this is one particular narrative framing of this history. Um, I do hope to continue to do research to trace narratives of other competing ideological publications um, beyond these, this institutional history. So what I'll focus on today is the changing nature of how electricity co-ops were understood socially and politically in three periods, the 1930s, the shift during World War II, and the post-war Cold War climate. First, I'll discuss the social meaning and economic impact of rural electrification, and then I'll follow with the political constitution and governance of the cooperatives. Okay, so first let's consider the historical scenario of this time period. While the history of farming and technology has never been static, electricity drastically changed the nature of farming. So published on the 100th anniversary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1962, the scenario was described in these journals as follows. The Homestead Act in 1862 opened up land so that many moved west, including eastern farmers, poverty-stricken urbanites, and immigrants. At the time, men and animals furnished the power because though mechanical reapers and the cotton gin had been invented, instituting agriculture and machinery was very slow. Women powered the home, pumping water, milking the cows, and keeping the chickens in vegetable gardens. But, quote, the family farm was isolated from other people, markets, and from ideas. There was little communication with neighbors, and farmers were cut off in times of emergency, such as fire or other accidents. Quote, but the effect of the farmer's isolation went beyond these considerations. Man cut off from the company of his fellow creatures turns inward. Loneliness turned many people on the frontier into characters, eccentrics or pugnacious types, suspicious of strangers. But perhaps it was children, naturally open and friendly, who felt the loss of human companionship most keenly. So after the Civil War, there was a great surge in applied science and invention, with many patents on farm equipment, um, such as barbed wire, the combine, the cream separator, the McCormick Reaper. And in 1908, the Model T car was invented. As described, quote, one of the best things about the Model T is that it turned other people into inventors. It was a car that could be repaired with a piece of bailing wire, and an ingenious man could turn it into just about anything. As one caption cartoon asked, do you have to drive into town today, Ma? I was counting on using the car for plowing the North 20. The car was also a power plant that could run a saw, fill a silo, or operate a washing machine. However, the so-called architects of the farm revolution were Edison and Westinghouse, accredited with discovering how to transmit electricity over long distances. Before then, inventors had thought of electricity as a force to be generated when and where it was needed. But in 1882, Edison built the Pearl Street Station in Manhattan, New York, and that brought electricity to light bulbs in 30 different homes. But 50 years later, a half century, only 10% of farms had electricity at a much lower number than in many other countries. So in 1935, the Rural Electrification Administration was established by FDR as part of the New Deal and a general program for unemployment relief. The following year, the REA received statutory authority with the passage of the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. This allowed the government to loan money to rural organizations in order to build electricity lines. The loans were paid back with interest to the government and many long before planned. In order to get a loan, rural organizations had to collectively organize and provide signatures of interest prior to getting funding and were tasked, tasked with stringing their own lines and wiring their own farms. In 1939, the REA became an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and pursued an area coverage policy that required 100% of rural areas to be electrified meaning that no farms could be left out. And I'll speak a little bit more about this later. In just five years, the number of electrified farms doubled. And by the 1960s, 90% of farms were electrified. One important juxtaposition is the contrast between urban and rural geographies in relation to electricity. There's no doubt that electricity changed the nature of urban spaces tremendously, from electric streetcars to lighting homes and industrial manufacturing. As has been documented, electricity was also marked with cultural meaning and discussed as the beginning of a new modern era. The image of a lit up Times Square and amusement parks represents a technological awe that cities were experiencing. 
And further, electricity in homes was, a, was symbolic of affluence and high status. However, rural farm life was a very different place, and there existed a great divide between the culture and politics of these two localities, exposing a marked difference in the manifestation of technology when tied to local cultural context. Rural areas were largely left out of this dawn of modernism, and this 50-year divide also led to skepticism, animosity, and recognized cultural difference between the two populations. Rural areas were left out for the simple fact that companies could not make a profit on low density and great distances between uh, customers, and so did not see a lucrative business opportunity in rural areas. So because of that, companies either didn't build lines at all or only very sporadically where they were guaranteed a profit. And so when they did, companies charged rural customers a much higher price than their urban counterparts. So the REA was dedicated to creating a parity of cost and access to rural inhabitants as a form of technological and also cultural equality between urban and rural areas, as well as a stimulus for the national economy as a whole. At the beginning of the program, especially where people were unfamiliar with electricity, there was a great push to educate farmers about what electricity could do for them both inside the home and on the farm. Electricity was promoted through, <laughs> through exhibits models of electrified farms, door-to-door -door demonstrations, and a push for members to educate their neighbors about it. When communities were first electrified, they retold stories in their publications about the day the lights came on. A story from the first edition of the journal that I was looking at described this. Quote, all we had was wires hanging down from the ceiling in every room with bare bulbs on the end. Dad turned on the one in the kitchen first and just stood there holding on the pole chain. He said to me, Carl, come here and hang on to this so I can turn on the light in the other room. <laughs> I knew he didn't have to do that, and I told him to stop holding it, and then it would stay on. He finally let go, and then he looked kind of foolish. Not all rural people felt, felt at ease with what they called their new servant. After all, electricity was the same stuff as lightning. It sounded dangerous to many who had no experience in using it. One woman in Kentucky kept a new electric iron on for weeks, or kept a new electric iron for weeks before she dared use it. Her neighbor always used a potholder to turn on her electric switches. Another kept sockets plugged at all times for fear the electricity would leak out. And one housewife wrote to the REA administrator to find out how to turn off her bedroom light at night. Nobody had bothered to tell her she had a switch. But members were encouraged to see electricity and co-op ownership as a, tr a source of tremendous pride, a deep connection to the cultural significance of being both technologically advanced and democratically connected to a larger social community. Electric cooperative excitement reached many aspects of social life. Here, for example, is um, a junior board group pledge of allegiance to the co-ops and the crowning of Miss REA and the sharing of new appliances. Here, using your washing machine to churn butter and also to shell peas at a much more efficient rate than by hand. Thought up by a Missouri housewife, of course, and attributed over and over to the state as the practice caught on elsewhere. The mention of the Missouri shelling of the peas came up <laughs> several times throughout the history that I looked at. Um, and great celebrations were had when communities were electrified, which included festivals, parades, and even funerals for kerosene and coal lamps where members would throw old lamps into a mass grave. The annual meeting was seen as a large community and family affair and as a place to learn about electricity uses, to promote increased use of electricity to lower the wholesale costs, and was complete with carnival games, dances, and contests, including essay contests, awarding the best planned electric farms, and even entire 4-H events dedicated to rural electrification. Shared ownership and social equality were highly promoted as well. In one story, a member recalled the memory of John Carmody, the one of the REA administrators. Quote, I remember one visit he paid to us at our old headquarters in a store building in downtown Greenville. When he walked in and saw the, count the counter separating the front of the office from the rear, the counter where the people paid their electric bills, he strongly urged us to get this blankety-blank counter out of here. It was his passionate belief that the people own their own electric system and that they should not be put in the position of their paying their bills across a counter to a stranger. This, to him, represented an uncooperative frame of mind. <laughs> 
Electricity was also widely attributed with improving the standard of living on farms, particularly for health and hygiene. Running water and refrigeration accounted for improved health, and electricity lines allowed for the building of rural health clinics and hospitals. Also, schools became electrified, seen to help with eyesight and create a more comfortable conditions for learning. And electrification also became a topic of study and teaching in schools. While much of electrification was discussed as increasing production on the farm, there was also a great deal of promotion that was geared toward the home and the domestic work for women, both in advertising for electrical appliances and also in easing the labor burden. In one description, just quote, just think of the thousands of rural women whose health is being broken down and are filling premature graves because of drudgery which could in some measure be alleviated by electrifying rural America. Likewise, women were also involved in cooperative activities with stories of those who were elected to operating positions and leading organizing campaigns. One thing that was stressed over and over again was the importance in educating both members and non-members of the cooperative story. This was promoted especially in the 1960s when cooperatives were changing membership profiles as migration patterns shifted, with more urbanites moving to suburban and rural non-farm areas and people mo moving from farms to urban areas. The impact this had on the cooperatives is that it created a second generation of members who were not involved in the developing of the co-op and the actual building of electricity lines. Additionally, some of these residents had never lived without electricity and so didn't have memories of the day the lights came on. Education became a key factor in maintaining the strength of cooperatives, showed, showing the perceived connection between the history of electricity and the autonomy of cooperative ownership, especially when threatened by companies. The major, major shift in the economics of farm life were in labor and productivity. The early years of electrification were discussed in terms of the amount of time saved, especially in labor hours, both inside and outside the home. Additionally, there was promotion of electricity on the grounds of increasing production because of electrified farm machinery, with things like electric brooders, milking machines, water pumping and refrigeration, production increased tremendously. However, World War II marked a great shift in the discourse of rural electrification. Instead of promoting the organizing of cooperatives, all focus shifted to the war effort. With Britain going through a food shortage, the REA farms were called upon to increase production at all costs, to cut waste, and to save in any way possible. Food will win the war and write the peace, and food for defense were the rallying cry to farmers, and victory was marked as being reliant on food production. Additionally, co-ops provided power for other military and defense purposes, as new loans had been suspended for the REA. Rural electricity was also attributed with the decentralization of industry as defense against attacks on U.S. soil. The practices that increased production during the food shortage shifted to promotion of farm management practices in the uh, post-war years. The 1950s brought a rise in big science, which on the farm manifested as scientific management that focused on business practices, standardized production, increasing capital, and decreasing heterogeneity of many small farms, as increased yield and industrialized practices created large gaps in profit. This shift to management and organization, including new forms of record keeping and moder modern data processing, alongside technological developments, can be seen as a root of what has become, or what we call corporate agribusiness today. Post-war rural life had changed, and technology produced many changes in the structure of farming. Fewer and larger farms, more integrated business operations, increased capital requirements, and greater dependence on services from off the farm. Farmers were more specialized and more mechanized with greatly increased productivity. Decentralization of industry and decreasing opportunities in farming brought increased migrations to the city, causing adjustments in the social and economic structure of families and communities. And urban sprawl to suburban fringe areas, including non-farm fam farm families to the countryside, led to a decline in the farm population and an increase in the non-farm rural population. Most of rural U.S. had electricity by the 1960s, and discourse shifted from management and organization to management and organization, a major difference from the early years of cooperation. But from the beginning, there was great animosity between companies that did not have an interest in building electricity lines and the rural cooperatives. Rural residents felt slighted for not being profitable enough for companies to give them access. This was the reason the REA instituted a policy of area coverage. As REA Administrator Morris Cook described, quote, there's been a growing demand for area electrification as more and more people have recognized that with the grant of monopoly privileges to private utilities, 
there is a corollary obligation on their part to provide service to the rural community as a whole, not only to a few especially profitable customers. The reluctance of many utilities to meet this social obligation gave birth to the present rural electric cooperative movement. When done piecemeal rather than for an entire area, such policies actually tend to defeat the possibility of real rural electrification because after a distributor is once serving the cream of an area, it is next to impossible to secure electric service for the balance of that area. The for-profit companies would build lines only to places where they could make a profit, referred to as cream skimming, leaving many farms cut off from the infrastructure grid. And here's a map example. So on the left, those are the, the company lines, and then on the right, and all the dots are the farms. On the right is all the proposed lines to make sure that every farm could be electrified. Another practice by companies was the building of spite lines. This referred to areas that had been ignored by companies until residents organized cooperatives. There were many stories in which soon after a community organized, sometimes even the evening of that organization, companies would come in and begin to build electricity lines and try and lure the members away from the co-op. This was sometimes met with great resistance. As one example um, written in the Chattanooga News, Citizens have greeted the power company with open hostility. One man took an axe to chop down wires which the utility had connected to his home against his orders. A woman loaded a 22 caliber rifle and chased linemen out of her front yard when they came on her property after she told them to stay out. A group of men, after the power company had run a line where they believed it had no right of way over their own property, crossed the wires and burned them apart. The same group has publicly stated they would up, will uproot every pole along a particular stretch of line which the utility has hastily erected last week. The farms had for years petitioned the power company to give them power at reasonable charges. For years the company had refused, serving only those thickly settled rural sections where service could be given at a minimum of cost and a maximum of profit. As farmers put it, the company had the cream and passed up the skimmed milk. So now shifting to the political economy and governance of these cooperatives, when originally created, they were touted as being exemplary democratic organizations. In one description of cooperative meetings, quote, in both method and spirit, it most closely resembles the institution of democracy, the old New England town meeting. And for another, quote, practical cooperative functioning as an economic enterprise is practical training in democracy. The best way to save democracy is to use it. Cooperators do just that. Good cooperators are good citizens because they have learned to apply the principles of democracy in their daily lives. So during these early, early years, the 30s to the 40s, the discourse links the economic organization of technological ownership with a political ideology of democracy, discursively relating citizenry to this form of ownership. The practices of voting and control of economic structure were seen to exemplify democracy. But this language transitioned during the war. Here's an example from 1940 describing um, the speech of Administrator Wallace. REA cooperatives, if they develop as true cooperatives adapted to their technical requirements, should prove to be a potent force in quickening the spirit of democracy and in perfecting the ability of our people to conduct democratic processes. Today, democracy is a, as a system is sorely beset. Ruthless, amoral dictatorships are making the great gamble of trying to crush the democracies. They are using every resource of skillful organization of the implements of force that modern technology has devised. We should not be negligent in strengthening our democratic institutions. We should not permit ourselves to become flabby, but we need not war to firm our muscles. We can firm our physical muscles by manipulating plows and harrows and reapers and binders, by building check dams, community dams, and boulder dams, by digging holes, erecting poles, and stringing wire on every rural highway by all those physical activity, activities involved in wise utilization and conservation of the resources a generous nature has given us. We can firm our spiritual muscles by cooperative effort in solving the organizational and management problems involved in such, such expressions of community aspirations and interests as are represented by the REA form of rural electrification. In these ways, we can firm the spirit, physical and spiritual muscles of our democracy. So here he links the democratic institutions, such as cooperatives, to the fighting for democracy abroad in a general sense and as a war platform. So what had been previously been declared to be democratic based on cooperative principles and especially voting 
shifted during the war as this was discursively aligned with the fighting for democracy abroad as a national project and as a justification for the REA being pared down and co-ops used to help with national defense. Um, and this text quotes, America has to be not only the arsenal, but the breadbasket of democracy. So with the food shortage and increased co-op production, this discourse completely shifted away from co-ops as representing democracy to being forces for fighting for democracy. After the war, the tie of democracy with nationalism, rather than the internal practices of the co-op, then shifted to an attack on the co-op system itself during the Cold War era. In a message from 1952, President Truman defends the REA co-ops against these attacks. I apologize for the length of this quote, but I think that it's um, very telling. I said then, and I say now, that when electric power is produced with the people's money, it ought to be used for the benefit of the people and not for the benefit of private power companies. But in the face of this record of accomplishment, the forces of private monopoly are today attacking, attacking this policy on many fronts behind one of the most vicious propaganda barrages in history. First, they said it was a wasteful use of government funds. Then suddenly, this propaganda line changed. It is easy to see why it changed. It wasn't convincing anyone because it wasn't true. Millions of people, including the members of cooperatives, could see by their electric bills that public power operations could be at least as efficient as private operations. So the private interest shifted to a new line of propaganda. They raised the cry of socialism, apparently on the theory that if you can't persuade people, maybe you can frighten them. If you haven't got the facts, try a few scare words. You can hardly pick up a newspaper or magazine these days without seeing an expensive full page advertisement denouncing the socialism of our public power program. Incidentally, the cost of these ads is mostly paid for by the taxpayers because the costs of such advertising are deductible for income tax purposes. It looks to me as though that advertising campaign itself is pretty close to socialism because the taxpayers finance so much of the cost. It's cynical because it assumes the people of this country cannot be trusted to decide on the basis of facts what is best for their own welfare. It assumes the way to get these things decided in a democracy is through big, expensive advertising campaigns in magazines and newspapers and a big, expensive lobby in Washington. The propaganda campaign is dangerous because it undermines faith in the free enterprise system itself. If the people ever come to be persuaded that the free enterprise system means they have to pay tribute to private companies in order to enjoy the great natural resources that belong to all of us, then they're going to begin to be doubtful about the free enterprise system itself. That is not what the free enterprise system means to me, but it seems to be what it means to the crowd that is back of this vicious propaganda campaign. With the support of rural electric cooperatives and other great progressive organizations, we will continue to advance until the right of every American to enjoy the full benefits of the age of electric power has been assured. So I think that this quote is important, especially in thinking, when thinking about our contemporary era, um, when, which it seems almost impossible to imagine our president being able to take such a stance, and when free enterprise is almost exclusively linked with private ownership, which is exactly what he is decrying. Um, the response from the RA co-ops at this time was a more aggressive education campaign to, meet, to be sure that members knew that some of the rumors spread by companies were untrue. The discourse um, describing co-ops also shifted in the 1960s as indicative of the Cold War climate with promotional materials calling co-ops private business enterprises and declarations that they were just like any other business, that they paid taxes and interest on the loans that they took out rather than touting their differences in operations as against those of the companies like they had earlier in the century. Overall, the shifting notions through which the discursive politics of this technology, technology historically, as well as the meaning attributed, can highlight the way in which technologies are shaped through a political economy that also shapes our subjective social world. They both reflect dominant political ideologies, but also act as material forms that can possibly resist them. In thinking through the design of technological systems, such considerations should inform the construction of them, not solely as supply and demand market ventures, but as possibly creating, great, creating greater equality, access, and integrated communities, if governed and implemented as political and social systems, rather than solely technological ones. So unfortunately, I just started this research, so I haven't looked at the discursive shifts that have happened since the 1960s. But as I mentioned before, it's highly probable that with the development of neoliberal practices 
um, during the 70s and 80s where democratic practices were tied to ideologies of the free market, there's most likely changing meaning attributed to these cooperatives, which is what I hope to research next. Okay, so how does this relate to the building of rural broadband or high-speed internet lines today? Right now, 18 million Americans living in rural areas don't have access to high-speed internet. The government has created a funding program to end this digital divide. Called the New Connect America Fund, the FCC allows companies to enter, enter, allows companies to enter into bidding in order to receive public funding. Um, however, a year ago, both Verizon and AT&T turned down government funds, vowing instead to proceed with their own plans on providing access to rural com uh, customers. So, the, in this article, um, Verizon spoke, a spokesman said that the company declined the money in order to focus on resources and capital on their own, on, broad, on their own broadband deployment plans. But one expert argues that the reason was that it wasn't enough money. Said a public policy director, phone companies have avoided delivering broadband to rural areas because their profit margins are higher in cities. It would likely take a much larger government subsidy to change their mind. It underscores how flawed it is to rely on private companies to serve these rural areas where their margins are not going to be high. AT&T and Verizon have shown declining interest in serving rural communities with wired internet service, instead focusing on wireless internet that is cheaper to deploy. However, other smaller companies have taken this money and have built um, broadband lines. And additionally, some telephone cooperatives have taken funding and have been able to give access to rural customers with an area coverage plan. <clears throat> but there are several instances where municipal utilities have been challenged by companies through court injunctions, reminiscent of the conflict of the spite lines of the past. So just very briefly, in relation to urban broadband um, or Google Fiber, um, while it was very much encouraged by the government of Kansas City, and again, I, I know you all know much more about this than I do, um, it's been also been criticized as creating digital divides with the initial sign-up process. So rather than having a policy of area coverage where every, everyone was met and guaranteed access, the fiber hoods that Google created were criticized in how they were drawn and directly as they separated along the historical racial divide of Troost Avenue. Likewise, in two years, Google can leave at will, and there's very little public regulation, which has been offered as one of the main reasons Google chose um, Kansas City for its experiment. That's one side. Maybe you all have, <laughs> you're enjoying it so much that you have a different opinion. Um, <laughs> not yet. So when thinking about technologies and when and how they become normalized parts of everyday life, I want to end with the question of technological citizenship when they transition from luxuries or tools to being necessities or rights. For 50 years prior to rural electrification, electricity was not seen as a right of US citizens, as I think that we would all argue today it is seen as one. Likewise, uh, likewise high-speed internet access has largely been kept from rural areas because of the same reasons, expensive to build without profit potential. Now the FCC states, quote, broadband has gone from being a luxury to a necessity for full participation in our economy and society for all Americans, end quote. But I would argue that how these lines are built and governed has a large impact beyond a simple access to this tool, with the potential to reflect on civic life in other ways. So I'll end with a quote that returns us to this issue in rural electrification. Taking care of needy, suffering people becomes a responsibility under our Constitution when the industrial manipulators who manage to bring about such a condition refuse to right their wrongs. The standard of living is such for the people of this nation that it's not merely possible, it is practical for everyone to enjoy the comfort and pleasures obtained from the use of electricity. But if the people who have managed to get control of such a precious utility are determined to use it merely as a vehicle to peddle worthless stock rather than serve humanity, then it becomes the responsibility of the government to make up to the masses of its people for the stupid mistakes and shortcomings of a few of its people. So lastly, um, some questions for further consideration. How does the political economy of technological infrastructures impact the meaning tied to its subjective use? And the question about technological citizenship. Um, how do technologies become rights rather than luxuries? Thank you.
We have time for a few questions. I'll come by with the microphone. We, of course, we're videotaping and we're broadcasting live, so we'll need to get your question uh, through the microphone. Just raise your hand and I'll come by. Yes. Um, uh, my grandparents lived on a, a farm near Boonville and um, had electricity at some time during my childhood. But before that, they were running on things called batteries in big glass jars. Do you know anything about this? <laughs> um, I mean, there were other ways that farms were generating power at this time. And again, I don't, I'm, I'm a sociologist. I don't know anything about the technological side of this or the technical side of this. But certainly, like wind power or windmills were used to pump water and, you know, I'm, and, uh, and store electricity or store power in other ways. So I'm, I don't know if somebody else here might be able to answer that. Okay, well, uh, distributing the electricity is one thing. Producing the electricity is another. Where did the REA come in to building the plants? Now, you've got the TVA, of course, if you look in the Tennessee Valley area. But outside of that area, where did the REA get involved in the production of electricity? Um, this, so the TVA was, is a public, a government owned electric, um, generating plant, right, or generating system as a whole. So there are few rural areas, and again, this was a small amount of the cooperatives that came together in order to produce more power. And a lot of that was in response to during World War II, the power shortage. So a lot of transmission co-ops had been developed. And then um, because electricity was becoming more and more popular, there was a great shortage of electricity and then the war effort. And so then cooperatives were able to get loans in order to actually produce power. And what they did largely was they were mostly coal power plants. So they kind of were sporadic and spread out, um, you know, all over rural areas, but mostly in areas that had a lack of access to enough electricity, sort of as a response to that. With regard to the distribution of broadband to the rural areas, are the cooperatives looking into this on their own for taking over a similar distribution process as, as they did with electricity? So um, I haven't looked that much into broadband, but what, from what I understand, um, the Basically, the public funding is coming through bidding contracts. And the only cooperatives that have so far been successful in getting those contracts are some telephone cooperatives. So I didn't have time to talk about it, but the REA also distributed loans for telephone access in rural areas as well. And some of those still exist, although very much uh, fewer in numbers than the electricity co-ops. So I've been able to find a couple telephone cooperatives that were able to get broadband, um, get public funding for the broadband and distribute, but not near on the scale. and none. None of the electricity co-ops that I've seen have been able to get the funding, or maybe are not interested in the funding. So far, I've only sort of looked at the contracts that have been distributed and not so much of the literature that's been written about it, so I can't fully answer that question. You may have started answering my question already. My father belong, was a farmer and belonged to a cooperative grain elevator, a cooperative creamery, a cooperative telephone service, Cooperative electricity, cooperative water service, cooperative uh, service station, corn and alcohol distribution now is coming in, and also banks. Have you compared any of those and how they um, relate to each other? Sounds like your grandfather was the, the best democratic citizen <laughs> out there, according to this. Um, I. I don't know that much about other cooperatives. I mean, I've been, because I set this up as a sort of comparative project between electricity cooperatives. Um, there are still a lot of cooperatives in the US, of course, and many of the ones you describe most likely still exist, although most of them have sort of consolidated under farm cooperatives. Um, there is a center for research on cooperatives at University of Wisconsin that actually, um, if you go on their website, they have a tremendous amount of material and they really parse through like the various cooperatives. 
Um, but I'm also looking at cooperatives that specifically got government funding, the sort of public funding of, and not funding, but loans. Um, and I don't know that many of those other smaller cooperatives or, or smaller industry cooperatives got the same sort, they certainly didn't have the same sort of New Deal programs that the REA sort of set up, was set up to do. But of course these sort of, the ideas of participation and democracy that I'm referring to would absolutely apply. Um, but it's really interesting, it's something I'd love to look more into. There were several comments. First of all, I was going to mention to you there was also a technological aspect to this in that private utilities up until this point in time it had a standard of building. Um, REAs actually um, changed some of those standards by implementing uh, new technologies and different materials and were then able to cut down on the poles per mile and the materials and change the technology, if you will, to enable them to transfer power over greater distances with less. That was item number one. Item number two, a gentleman had mentioned about the broadband. Um, I'm a member of an electrical co-op in central Missouri called Como Electric based out of Boonville. And they had had applications, numerous applications for broadband service uh, into the federal government, which were all rejected. Uh, now, they serve a great area around the Lake of the Ozarks, which is high density, and, and ironically, from what some of the... What they are doing is they are launching a self-funded broadband system, and they are going through in a four-step process or four-phase process to their highest density customers first, and then using that profit to pay for building out the rest of the system. So that, that is in progress now in central Missouri. Just a comment. Uh, number one, thank you for coming and, and thank you for taking on this research. Um, the, um, there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of regulatory barriers to, to being able to diversify the utilization of infrastructure that's already out there. Um, many of the poles and wires have right-of-way agreements with landowners, and those right-of-way agreements restrict the ability to, for uh, the company to only use those for their purposes. So they can't loan and use a lot of that outside the cities to other, to other facilities. That's why a lot of times why you used to see phones on one side of the on one side of the highway, phone poles on one side and electric poles on the other because they couldn't share. Um, and so there's there's a still a lot of, t of regulatory barriers that are out there. We're trying to figure out how to do that. If you want a really interesting scenario on, on um, what the infrastructure looks like without uh, without regulation at all, go to the third world. There's no phone wires anywhere. You'll see phone towers. There's no electric lines except for one in a town. In, uh, in South Africa, in one particular country, they don't have any lights in your houses, but there's one large pole at the center that the light comes on at night and stays on until it gets at some time around 11 o'clock at night, and then it goes off. You know, so there, it, it's interesting to see the way that the infrastructure gets developed without regulation. And, uh, and you know, um, I've been to a lecture here where Sprint was talking about the opportunity. Uh, they're working very hard in the third world to um, be able to do banking over the cell phones because nobody has credit cards, nobody has access to banks, but they've all got cell phones. So. We have time for one more question. If there's one, oh, yes, sir. I really appreciate your uh, comments. Uh, some of us have lived through some of this. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that this really reminds me of, it brings to bear the meaning and the constitution of what's what does that mean for, you know, what do we mean for by the general welfare and how does it impact people? And I'm so glad to see you put up Sam Rayburn and another one would be Lyndon Johnson. 
who said, when I get the power, we're, you know, in Congress, things will change because I saw my mama and my grandma die early because of lack of this. So I think it challenges us to um, think about um, our neighbor, really. And I wondered also if you've uh, collected or done oral history interviews, which is kind of down my alley, I guess, of the effects of getting electricity on people's lives. Um, and w whether you've done that or whether you're going to include that in your research, sort of a personal type of uh, investigation. Thank you. Um, I haven't, I was doing the historical side of this first, but one thing that I think is so important is because many of these cooperatives were developed in the 30s, the people who actually built the lines are, um, you know, in, in their older years. So these are the important sorts of things that need to happen, um, the, the interviews and, and histories. Um, one great thing that has happened recently is the 75th anniversary of, of the REA. And so because of that, they've actually collected a lot of, you know, personal stories and that sort of thing. Um, another side of the research that I would like to do is to conduct interviews with contemporary members of cooperatives who weren't involved in the building of the electricity lines to, in order to see if they have the same sort of uh, cultural association or pride or um, the meaning attached to being a co-op member as those who actually developed the co-op did. If the, if the co-ops have been successful in maintaining the sort of co-op story that they felt was so important. But yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. It's something I really think is important, an important side to this research. Thank you for the wonderful lecture.